um, I've re actually refrained myself not to say a joke, not that it's rude or anything, but last time I said that, you know, Adventists, we actually like to sit at the back and then we make people walk down the aisle of shame that come late to church and they sit at the front. And I, at, at, at a church, I said that we actually um, reserve the front seats for angels, like a good Adventist church. And the funny thing is I said that and nobody laughed at the church. It was just like dead silence. And, it was, and I was a visiting speaker, so I wasn't even their pastor. And it was just silence, and I'm like, oh, let us say pray. <laughs> because it just didn't go, like, they just didn't get it, you know. But it's true, you know, it's funny, every you go to, it doesn't matter what Adventist church you go to, there's always room at the front if you're late. Because right? we want to make sure the whole church wants to know that you are late for church, and we want to see you sit down there. So if you are late in the back in the hall, you're most welcome to come and sit at the front. I'm going to share you a story this morning that you're going to actually be, probably be mad at me for sharing. You're going to be upset. And then you're going to say, thank you for sharing that, right? And I hope that's the feeling that you get when I share the story. Because when we read the Bible text this morning, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, verse, verse 22. But this is a, a, a talking about the Beatitudes. And he says, and I'll repeat it and then, and then I'll go into my story. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. <clears throat> Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice iniquity, or in other translations, lawlessness. Verse 24 says, therefore, and it's interesting, if you read it, this is not a continuation. There's actually a bit of a break here because Jesus tells them off and then he actually goes, I want to actually help them explain what I'm going to say or what I mean. And he says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and it was a great fall. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as a scribe. Ladies, thank you so much for, you know, um, your children's story, object lesson. Um, I knew, uh, I was looking around when you were telling it, the adults were so keen on what was happening there. We missed out. So next time, can you please do it on a table so we can see? No, but thank you very much. I was actually made a really good point. Thank you for that because I had a sneak peek of what you were doing. Have you ever heard of a lady by the name of Hannah Moore? Write the name down, Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, -A -N -N -H, Moore, M-O-R-E. And it's actually, there's another lady by the name of Hannah Moore who actually liberated the, the slaves. It's not this one. Make sure when you write her name, Hannah Moore, make sure you write missionary and put there Adventist, okay? You can find her story in, in Testimonies Volume 1. The case of Hannah Moore, and then in Testimonies chapter two, um, volume two, where the neglect of Hannah Moore. And this lady is a very interesting lady. About 1851, in a small sort of church gathering, Stephen N. Has Stephen Haskell preaches a sermon. She gets, she believes, and she believes in the Sabbath. So then she she actually, but then she was. But she wanted to, um, she was a missionary, right? She was, she was the first missionary, a woman missionary into the Indian preservations. Like when there was literally, it took you weeks just to travel, you know, mere kilometers, right? She comes across Sabbath keepers. She believes in them. Now she's not an adventist, she's a congregationalist. 
So she was independent, but she believed in a Sabbath, Sabbath message. She goes to, on a missionary trip to West Africa. And it is said that in the six years, she actually um, was preaching the Sabbath message for Sunday Keeping Church. They sponsored her. They, they actually paid for her to go there. She actually went over there and started. And she actually met an Australian by the name of Dickinson. And he actually believed. And those two, they, kicked, they actually kicked Dickinson off. And they said, no, you no longer can work for us because you believe in the Sabbath message. So go home. He actually had to go back to Australia. He's the first Australian Adventist, right, from this lady, Hannah Moore. She continues to, to work, and, and in the meantime, she writes letters back to the to Adventist Review to, to tell them about what's happening in, in, in West Africa, right? And, she, and, and so you got Uriah Smith, you got J.N. Loughborough, you got Ellen White, all these prominent believers of our, of our leaders of our church, actually, they, they know about her and they know about her story. And she's actually sharing the Sabbath message. She comes back because she says, oh, I, want, oh, I want to be back to where my people are at Battle Creek. Now, at the time, there's probably about six, five, 6,000 Adventists in America. And about a, a third of them live in Battle Creek. So that was like the mecca of Adventism there. Right? At the very early, early on, she comes back to, to the U.S., in about 18, what did I say, 1861, so 1866. She comes back to, in, 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 to, to and, and um, Haskell says, oh, come and live with us. So she goes, okay, oh, she, she stayed with them. Oh, she says, I need to get to Battle Creek. I need to get to Battle Creek. Okay, so she finally paid away. Now this lady, she comes and she's in her 40s, late 40s, mid 40s, something like that. She's been a missionary. She spoke multiple languages, a very intelligent lady. Um, her ability to memorize the Bible, to, um, to preach, to share. You know, from a very young age, she actually had this desire to, to, to share. And Ellen White was so, actually, she was so fond, like she was actually looking forward to, to um, Hannah Moore coming because this is like, and she's never met Hannah Moore, but she's read about Hannah Moore. And she's like, oh, here, this is somebody that can help our work, help us with our work in this field of missionary. So she goes, she finds her way, she pays her way to, um, to Battle Creek. And yeah, she's greeted with, um, by, by Jay and Loughborough, Uriah Smith. Oh, you're Hannah Smith. Oh, yeah, what are you doing here? Oh, well, I'm hoping that... Um, to get a job here and teach at the school or, or, or teach because that you know back then there's no formalization of school system so she was like I'm hoping to teach at a school or at a church school or teach the kids of the church and start a school but the way she looked remember this lady's been in West Africa in pretty much at that time was like the other end of the earth right she didn't look well she didn't dress well. She didn't have any money. Her clothes were probably her clothes were probably about twenty years behind date. But it's, the clothing is more of a functional thing than a fashion thing, right? So she didn't look like a Christian should look, in essence. She asked, "Oh no, there's no jobs." She asked for a place to stay. Oh, you can stay with us for a week. But you have to leave on Friday because Sabbath is coming and we've got to get ready. So they managed to, um, so she stayed with the family for a week, or even five days. And then she, she's found a place to stay early, early sort of inception of our sanitarium. And then she managed to stay there for about three days, four days. And they said, you have to go. You know, Here's a lady who took on and believed the Adventist message, the Sabbath message. She wanted to be with the Sabbath keepers, her people. She came to where her people were and no one could help her. You know, she actually wrote a letter to one of her former colleagues. Um, he's a pastor by the name of Thompson. 
And, um, and, and they always, it was an open invitation to them that if you ever come back to America, if you ever want a place to live, you can always come and live with us, Auntie Hannah. And that's what the children called her and referred to her. So she wrote a letter. I don't know the, the geography of, of America, but like she, they, this, this, this family, this pastoral family lived in like the most remote place in Michigan where you actually had to go catch a boat to go to their little island, right? She wrote a letter to this, this family and said, come, come live with us. Ellen White and James White heard about, and they were anticipating her to come. And, the, and then they found out that she, nobody cared for her at Battle Creek. And they found out that, that she'd gone to go and live with one of her colleagues that was doing missionary work in West Africa. So they started making contact, James White. And they said, hey, look, we're here. We're not far. If you come and meet us, come and live with us. Here's Ellen White saying, hey, if the church at Battle Creek, our people are not going to care for her. I will take her on. We, she'll come and live with us. There's, and she actually says in her, in her letters, she says, actually, there was actually no need for me to, because we've only got one child at home. But she's one of us. And she actually, she, you know, Ellen White says that Hannah Moore could have done so much more. She like, here's a lady that had the experience to start the missionary work that Jay and Andrew started seven years later after her death. And he was trying to figure out how does the missionary thing work. But here's a lady who actually has gone before and had the experience, had the announce, had the understanding. And Ellen White was like, here's somebody that God could use, and we needed her. And yet, the people of Battle Creek didn't. And so the letter got to, to Hannah, and she said, look, um, I'm only making, I think it's like $1.50 a week, sewing, looking after the family, um, because I don't work on, on Sabbath. And then um, because they're Sunday keepers, they don't want me to work on Sunday, so I'm working five days a week. Um, I don't have money. To get to where you are, I need, if you can, if you can send me $10. And I hope that I'll get out here before the winter comes. That, gets, that letter gets back to, to James and Ellen White. They're still making arrangements. They write another letter, correspondence. The second correspondence, Hannah writes that all is well. You know, I've... um. Because remember, this pastor, being in congregation, he would go have preaching appointments all over. And he's, she's writing to, to James and Ellen White and says to them, you know, God has been good. You know, um, Pastor Thompson or Mr. Thompson, who's a pastor, he's also asked me to, to um, replace him when he's away on preaching appointments to ask him to preach at his church, which I'm going to do. But I was told not to preach about the Sabbath message which is fine. But she rejoices in a little victory because she goes, but his wife, Mrs. Thompson, she's a believer. Like she believes in our message. She believes in the Advent message. But it's just that if it wasn't for her stubborn husband, the whole family would be Adventists. You know the interesting thing about that? This lady was preaching about Adventism before she even got baptized. She started, she planted six churches in West, West Africa. She was moved every six weeks because they didn't want her to preach about the Sabbath message. So every six or so weeks, they'll go, no, sorry, we've got to move to a different mission, right? She wasn't even baptized then. It was only when she got back into America, living with Haskell in 1861, the moment that the first opportunity she had to get baptized, she got baptized into the message. As a Seventh-day Adventist. When she got baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist, she says, I want to go and live where the Adventists are, at Battle Creek. And the church turned her away. They turned her away. She had to go and find refuge in another family who wasn't even Seventh-day Adventists, even Sabbath keepers. And she lived in this house, in the attic, where the smoke, the chimney for the stove went up. And she was living in this attic, and the smoke leaked. And she was telling James and Ellen White this, that, you know, there was one night where she actually woke up coughing. She, st- she couldn't breathe because of the, the carbon monoxide and the gases coming off from, from the stove. Your story doesn't end well. 
Winter, the, the, she got the letter too late. Winter comes, river frozen over. She can't make her way to meet Ellen and James Watt. And she actually dies. And it was about two, three, maybe, yeah, about two, three weeks later, Ellen White finds out. And this is the most scathing remark that Ellen White will ever write, that you'll ever read, I believe. And when I read it, it, it hits home. It, and because I look at this, it's not just about, oh, they didn't do. It actually, if you look at it, what are we doing? Listen, I'll read it in, in testimonies. Um, chapter, oh, sorry. Volume 1, chapter 114. And I'll read, I'll read it here. It says, is this mic on? Yep. Our brethren at Barrow Creek and in this vicinity could have made more than a welcome home for Jesus in the person of this godly woman. But that opportunity is past. It was not convenient. They were not acquainted with her. She was advanced in years and might be a burden. Feelings of this kind barred her from the homes of professed friends of Jesus who are looking for his near advent and drove her away for those from those she loved to those who opposed her faith to northern Michigan in the cold of winter to be chilled to death. She died a martyr to the selfishness and covetousness of professed commandment keepers. If that doesn't upset you, I don't know what, like, those words, I don't know if you get, got that. Battle Creek rejected Jesus who came in the form of Hannah Moore. Those are the words from Ellen White. And then she, at the end there, she says, she died a martyr to the selfishness and covetousness of professed commandment keepers. When we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, verse 22, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say in my name in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I would declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. She did not blame anyone in particular. But when she wrote that, she said she wrote to the Battle Creek Church who were leaders there. There were fellow worshippers there. It was a scathing remark. It was heartfelt. And she, she, you remember, Ellen White never got a chance to meet Hannah Moore. Right? She never got a chance to meet this lady. But yet, the support and the willingness for her to say, to go that far and say, hey, you rejected Jesus in the form of Hannah Moore when she came to Battle Creek. And yet, you profess to do all these things in my name. You reject so and so at Rockingham Church. And yet, you profess. To keep the Sabbath. You profess to return tithe and offering. You profess to do Adra. You profess to pray. You profess to do all these things. But yet you rejected the very soul that needed your help the most. And Jesus says, depart from me. Those are hard sayings. Because when you practice iniquity, which is sin, which sin is what? Transgression of the law. Now, the law doesn't save us. We know that. But it is a standard that God expects us to live to because of Him. And in the book of Psalms, chapter 32, verse 5. I acknowledge Psalms, chapter 32, verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
in that one verse, we have iniquity, transgression, and forgiveness. And when Jesus says that in the book of Matthew, depart from me those you practice iniquity. Until we seek forgiveness, we cannot be in that presence. And that's why he gives us the counsel on verse 24 onwards. He says, build your house on the rock. Now, see, this is the funny thing. When you, when you read the story, and I would encourage you to, to read the story in testimonies, to actually go on to um, YouTube, Adventist Review, and put there the, um, the, the forgotten story of Hannah Moore, Adventist Review on YouTube, right? And Bill Knott has done a, dis, uh, a dissertation on him, on, on him, him, has done one on her and recounts the whole story. Found her grave. The house that she lived in is still there. Um, you know, all these, like, she was the first Baptist Adventist um, to be baptized at the church that where he was attending when he was a kid, you know. So, it's like, just look it up because it's a fascinating story because when you look at that, sometimes we think we're building our house on a rock. But in actual fact, we're building our house on the sand. Because on the surface, the house belongs to God. On the surface, we are good people. I give up my time. I, 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 where's the youth? I give up money. <laughs> no, but you know, I, 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 I volunteer. I lead out Bible studies. I lead a department in the church. I help out with the kids. I do all these good things. And that's great. Battle Creek was great. They're doing all these great things. But when somebody in need that looked a bit different than us, that dressed a bit different than us, that speaks a little bit different than us, that actually maybe smells different than us, are we willing to invite them home? Are we willing to, and when I say home, I'm not talking about your home. Because that's your own personal choice. When I'm talking about home, I'm talking about here at our church. This is our home at Rockingham Church. Are we willing to invite them here and make them feel welcome? Because they're a little bit different. Because if not, then the house that we built is actually not on the rock. It's actually on the sand. And that is the difference between hearing something and doing it. See, Jesus says here, verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, hearing and doing. But if you hear only, you just build that house, but you don't do what he's asked, which is to build it on the rock. You build it on the sand because he's a, oh, you know what, I'd rather live near the beach. Because I get the view of the, of the ocean. All right? Now, we know living near the beach is not the best because of erosion. Okay? And it's mostly sand. And you see pictures in, in, in Sydney where their backyards and their swimming pools are collapsing into the ocean because of the erosion. Because they built their house on sand. See, so this even from a, from a secular perspective, it makes sense. But from a spiritual perspective, it actually holds even more weight. For us personally, what are we building? Is our house, is it on a rock or is it on sand? And we have to be honest with ourselves. Because we have to, we make mistakes, I get it. And the Battle Creek Church at Venice End made a big mistake. But you know what? That's how address started. Because after coming back, Ellen White comes back. And she writes a letter to Battle Creek believers. And it was there that the leaders got together and started the Benevolent Society. And that's where Adra came from. All because of what we didn't do for Hannah Moore. It was a mistake. And to this day, you know what? The church of Battle Creek said, we will, we will pay for her to come back and bury get her ashes to be buried with her fellow Sabbath keepers at Battle Creek. 
So one of the Baptist members said, oh, well, let her ashes be buried with us. And she's buried between a husband and a wife. She's in the middle. And it's still there. We have not moved her back to Battle Creek. Well, that's a sad story. You know, something good came out of that. And, and Ellen White laments at the fact that what could have been, that our work could have begun a lot earlier if we had accepted Jesus in the form of Hannah Moore. And that's my, my challenge and this morning to you. Is that for you to build your house, to reflect, even your own personal life, in your own walk, in your own family. If your house, is your house built on sand or rock? If it's built on sand, you know, the beauty is that you can actually rebuild it and move it onto the rock. You can actually rebuild. And the beauty about that is that God is in the, the business of rebuilding. We see it all the time. An altar gets broken, he says, repair this altar. Your house is broken, I will repair this house. You have, de- you have depart from me, I will bring you back into the fold. And he will do everything to actually be part of this, build my, your house on that rock. If your house is on the rock, praise God for that. But can you make it better? Can you make that house stronger so that when the wind does blow, that you can go, praise God. In the midst, because in the midst of what's happening, you know, we build a house on the rock. When a storm comes, when something happens in our life, in the midst of that, sometimes we don't see God. And we go, and like Job, why is this, like, not like Job, Job's wife, why, and his friends, why is this happening to me? Because we don't see God in the midst of that. Even though our house is on the rock, in the midst of that, we don't see God. What I, I'm, I'm asking is that, Can we make it better by saying that in the midst of going through that storm, we can say God is in charge. See, when Peter, when Jesus walked on the water and Peter said, let me walk on water too. So he says, let's go walking. And in the midst of that storm, Peter forgot who was in charge. And that's why he fell. You know, we we, we know we understand about faith and, and, and all that. But in the midst of that storm, he didn't see Jesus. He actually focused on the storm. He focuses and goes, oh man, this is scary. Why is this happening? I go to church, I do all these things. You know, we pray, we have family worship. You know, we've, we've cast out all these things that would actually invite the devil into our household. We've done all that. Why is this still happening to us? And then I think this is where we need to go, praise God that he is with us through the midst of that storm. That through that fire, he still stands with us like the three Hebrew boys. He stands with us in that fire. In the wilderness for 40 years, he wanders with us for 40 years. He didn't leave them there. He still wandered with them and still cared for them for those 40 years. We praise God for that. And that's the challenge I want to, myself, my family, and for you. You know, the last past week, my children, the two boys especially, they, they, They've been crying every night. They're going to bed. This is not being recorded, so they're not watching me on, on YouTube. They won't watch on YouTube. But, um, you know, they've been crying. Because I said, why do we have to die? What if I'm not saved? Are you, is, is, is seven too young to be baptized? You know, why, why do we, like, why does Jesus just come now? Because it's just like he's playing a video game because, like, why do we have to die? Why can't he just come and take us home now? And what are we going to do in heaven? Like, what if I'm not saved? As a father, it was worse. Well, for me, as a minister, my children are asking me that. And I'm like, my heart's breaking for them. Because how do I put it in the language that I understand? But at the same time, I praise God because they're questioning that. Ellen White, at the age of 12, when she heard the message, she says, will I be saved? She was questioning her own salvation at the age of 12. You're you're never too young. Thank you for the little boy that said the prayer. That was awesome. Praise God. 
because you're never too young. God will interpret that prayer. God will take that prayer, transform it to be sweet. But you're never too young to question that. You're never too old to question that. But praise God that the questions are being asked. That gives us the opportunity to do something about it. That gives us the opportunity to say, like I said to my son, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yes. Well, what does the Bible say? And his older brother goes, well, if you believe in Jesus, he says, you have eternal life. And I said, there will they go. That's what your, bro- your brother's telling you this. And he's reading it from the Bible. And that, you know, put his mind at ease. Because my youngest boy, he, he, does, he can't watch anything that is scary. Like as in anything that, he, he walks through the shops. If there's any toys that he feels for him from a spiritual sense, he will actually just cover his eyes. He will shake and he will actually be so scared. He actually, he will jump up and he will just, his face will be walking. Like especially the worst time is during Halloween. And he'll jump and we'll walk through the shops. His, his face is buried in my shoulder. He just doesn't, because he can't sleep. He came home one day from school and he's like, Dad, I can't sleep. And we didn't sleep for like three months. Like just, because he just couldn't close his eyes. Because he got told a story of, a, um, of how a, a wombat became a wombat and, and a kangaroo became a kangaroo from the, the um, First Nation people, the Indigenous people, right, at school. And we had to write a letter to the teachers that you can't do, like, please remove him from the room. Because for him, he is so in tune into the spiritual thing that he actually, and his sister was so upset by it. It's like, because she watches some things that, she, you know, the ads on the thing. And then, so he can't sleep. And he's like, so he's actually towing his sisters and his brother in line. And I'm sharing this because that's in my household. How can I make my household better and be built on a solid rock? Because we all have something that we're struggling with or going through or challenges that we're faced with. But we have to be honest that there's moments where we are not building on rock. And I'm only being able to recognize that in the midst of the struggles that Jesus is there because I know that upon reflection, he's always been there. And because he's always been there, I know that he will still be there with me because of that. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, for your words. That you give us an opportunity to build our house upon that rock. Lord, we ask that if our house is in disrepair upon that rock, that you help us to build and rebuild and make it stronger. So that in spite of the storm that is faced, we know you are there holding us together. Lord, if our house is on sand, We ask that you help us to relocate our house to be on solid ground, to be built upon you. Lord, we pray for this church in Rockingham, that this church be built upon the rock, which is you. That when people come to this house, that they'll feel welcome in spite and and regardless of how they look, smell, what they're wearing, what language they speak. May they feel welcome. May you use us. And may we learn from our history so that we don't repeat it, Lord. I ask that your Holy Spirit will be our guide. Help us to discern so that we can be more like you. We pray all these things in your wonderful name. Amen. With those beautiful words, may we all rise as we sing our closing hymn, Rock of Ages, 300. (laughs) Rock of Ages, clear for me, let me hide myself in thee.
Father, Lord, as we leave this place, may we know that we've been with God. May we know that there's a place for us as we just sung that hymn. Let us hide in him so that we can face the world. Bless us now. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.